Hi guys! So, I realise it's been a little while since I've done a currently reading video, a few months um, for certain, and those were videos that I usually looked at the three books I was actively reading at that time and told you about my thoughts to this point in the book, um, which is always interesting because then when you finish the book it's, it's interesting to reflect on what you were thinking during the book and if that's changed or not. And I thought since it's more the beginning of February, I might do a video that I talk to you about the three books I'm currently reading and also share with you the rest of the books I plan on reading in February. So it's a bit of a currently reading slash TBR as I'll finish the three books I'm reading and hopefully read some more. Um, and if you like this, then I might start doing this more regularly at the beginning of each month. But you get the concept, so without further ado, let's get into the books. So the first book I'm going to talk about is the book that I have kind of put down for a few days but plan on picking back up now for reasons I will explain and that is Conversations with I Endy, Socialism in Chile um, by Regis Debris. Well it's by Regis Debris but I mean a lot of the text is from uh, Salvador Allende who was the president of um, Chile. He just interviews Allende and he also writes quite a long introduction which I'm still reading at the moment because it's about half the book and uh, it's not a long book as you can you can tell and this actually came out in the 1970s whilst Allende was still president before um, the sort of coup uh, when he died in the early 70s as well and I recently saw a documentary called Ne Passaran which was about the coup that I really really enjoyed it's such a good documentary would highly highly recommend and it made me curious to learn a little bit more about Chile because I had very little information to be honest. So I thought I'd pick up a little book and this was in the Verso Christmas sale and I thought it'd be interesting to read actual interviews with Allende. Uh, however, <laughs> what I found when I was reading this, I'm about uh, 30 pages in. The actual main body of the text is about 128 pages, um, so it shouldn't take me very long. <laughs> but what I found is because this book came out in the 70s, there is a real assumption that you as a reader have more knowledge about Chile and Chile's political background and the um, politics in Chile in the 70s than I do as somebody who is both not Chilean, has very limited knowledge of uh, general Southern American politics um, and is not living in the 70s. <laughs> so I found it quite dense and um, wasn't really absorbing everything because I didn't feel like I was getting all the context or it was just being put in a slightly academic way that would be fine if I was familiar with the topic but I'm not familiar with the topic. So, like I mentioned, I put this down and uh, a couple of days ago I watched the first part of a three part documentary, so each documentary is full length, uh, called The Battle of Chile, which explores uh, the political climate leading up, well post the election of Allende and then leading up to the election of like the MPs in Chile um, to uh, the coup. The first documentary ends at the sort of first attempt at a coup. Cliffhanger. <laughs> um, and then I haven't watched the second two documentaries yet, but that documentary was filmed in the 70s and it's all interviews with people in the 70s and filming real footage and it's incredible, such a good documentary. It's in Spanish but subtitles if you don't understand Spanish, which I don't. And I feel like I've now got a little bit more context so I think I'm going to go back in and try and uh, pick back up from where I was because I'm not saying I didn't understand anything, it's not, it's not that bad. I just felt like I was maybe missing some of the details or finding it a little bit um, more difficult to wrap my head around because I didn't know as much about Chile but now that I feel like I know a little bit more and I plan on watching the next two parts of the Battle of Chile um, I think it will flow a little bit better and I'm really excited to get to the bits that are interviews with IND uh, since he's the particularly the person that I find interesting in this context um, and uh, yeah so I'm gonna keep going with this one during the month and hopefully just learn more about Chile in general um, and then I am also reading Queen of Blood, uh, book one of the Queen of Renthia series by Sarah Beth Durst. I've never read anything by this author before, um, but my friend Jill and I are sort of buddy reading this with one another this month. Uh, we picked it up together in Forbidden Planet. And it, as you can probably tell from the just aesthetic of this book, it is a sort of high fantasy novel. I'm on page 70 something of this book, it's 300 and something pages, I'd say maybe about almost a quarter of the way through. And I'm enjoying it, I'm not like quite convinced is my favourite fantasy novel of all time but I'm intrigued by the premise. Um, it's reminding me of a lot of um, other literature particularly and I don't know why because it's not dystopian but it keeps reminding me of The Hunger Games. It's also set 
partially in a school for magic, which I wasn't expecting from the blurb on the back. So that has kind of like Harry Potter elements to it. Um, but it's set in this like high fantasy world um, where there are spirits of all the different elements that are incredibly dangerous, like earth spirits, water spirits, fire spirits, and they threaten people's lives. And at the beginning of the novel, our protagonist's village is destroyed by these spirits, which is uncommon because the role of the queen in the society is to use her powers, which are uh, more than any other woman in this society, to control the spirits. And there is like, why did she let them loose? Did they, were they not commanded by her, did she lose her control? We don't know. Um, and it's now a few years later and our protagonist who discovered she had an affinity for spirits um, during uh, the attack on her village is now uh, applying and attending uh, the school for magic to learn to control the spirits better and just uh, hopefully protect her people. Really love the concept, haven't come across like a magical world concept quite like that before um, that is very emphasis on the relationship with these spirits and I'll be interested to see how that develops and how she builds that world um, and I hope they all makes sense and uh, f follows through on like the initial intrigue. Um, it's the first in a series and I believe the second two are already out. I don't know if it's a trilogy or there's going to be more, um, but obviously if I enjoy this, this means there is more to read. And I'm enjoying reading it with my friend Jill. I love reading high fantasy with her because um, we have very similar taste and it's, there's just something really nice about being able to do that with somebody. But yeah, I actually don't have a terrible amount to say yet about this. I think I'm not far enough into the meat of the novel to really um, have a solid opinion but I'm enjoying it so far and I'm intrigued to see where it goes. I am then reading The Women in the Room which is another non-fiction book. This one is Labour's Forgotten History by Nan Sloan and I am adoring this book. Uh, this is probably my favourite of the three I'm currently reading but they're all very different and have different things to offer. And this one was very kindly sent to me for a review by the publisher Ivy Torres and I'm so, so pleased that they did send it because it's honestly brilliant. I've not even finished it and I already have been recommending it to people which is such a nice feeling. So as long as the book continues in that vein and at the end I still want to recommend it to people then I am so pleased uh, with picking this one up. I mean, you can kind of get a gist of what the contents is from the title but it specifically concentrates on sort of um, political movements in the United Kingdom actually pre the formation of the Labour Party. Uh, so the Labour Party is a political party in the UK that was formed in 1900. Like with any history surrounding politics or just any history in general there is a tendency to overlook the women because they didn't necessarily have as like um, public a role in things or they had to fight harder to have their voices heard um, and uh, this is exploring women's role in both the sort of like formation of the Labour Party and its early years pre and around the First World War. So equally overlapping with the time that suffrage was a massive issue in the United Kingdom and you get the suffragettes and the suffragists and um, those movements but equally you're getting uh, movements for uh, the uh, like universal suffrage. So, so when the like major suffrage movement I think a lot of us think of surrounding the suffragists and suffragettes um, is going on in the United Kingdom, it's not just women that don't have the vote. Uh, working class men don't have the vote either and there are equally campaigns going on to fight for everybody to have the vote, not just uh, the upper classes, whereas there are certainly some uh, branches of the suffrage movement involving women that were only fighting for upper class women to have the vote. That's kind of off topic because this book isn't specifically about suffrage. But it's about the other things basically that women were doing in politics. It's about the massive important things that women were doing through this lens of focusing around the Labour Party to kind of give it a central um, point because the Labour Party were quite often at the forefront of um, more progressive politics but at the same time I think if you're just generally interested in the history of women in involvement in politics this is such a good book. It's so readable. It's not like the Yendi book where it assumes you already know everything. <laughs> um, or at least that's how that reads to me. Um, this is very, very accessible, very readable. Um, and I'm just finding it so interesting learning about all these women that are often overlooked. There's some uh, little uh, coloured uh, inserts in the middle. Here's some pictures of some awesome women doing awesome political things. Yes, love them. Um, I'm just... Oh, so excited to, to learn more. It's it's brilliant. Um so <laughs> I 
as you can tell, I'm very much enjoying this. I am about, again, about a quarter of the way through this one. It's actually not terribly long, it's less than 300 pages, so I will be powering through this one and I want to pass it on to my mum once I'm done with it, so uh, that's what I'm reading there. And then I thought, like I said, I would mention to you the rest of the books I want to read in February. So, uh, where to start? So the first book I'll mention is the one that is for my Patreon book club, so I of course will most certainly be reading this month, and that is James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room. Uh, we're reading this over on my Patreon book club which I'll link down below. So this is a novel from the 1950s um, and it explores the relationship between two gay men living in Paris in the 1950s, one of whom decides to uh, marry a woman and sort of uh, live that kind of like pretense of being heterosexual because he thinks it will just be safer and easier for him and it's about their relationship and the different struggles that they both face and the decisions that they make. And I have never read any of James Baldwin's fiction but I hear amazing things so I'm so excited to finally be reading this one. I then plan on reading Vertigo and Ghost by Fiona Benson. I've actually read the first poem in this, um, but I wouldn't say I'm actively reading it as much as I am the other ones, but I do plan on just sitting down and kind of consuming this, which is what I tend to do with poetry collections, as it is on such an incredible theme. The book focuses particularly on the Greek god Zeus and through that explores both sexuality and sexual violence. In Greek mythology, Zeus is uh, really constantly sexually abusing women, uh, mortal women in particular, but also goddesses. And it's about that, it's exploring that through poetry and it's just, oh, I just, I'm so excited for this. I think from what I've read already, it's going to be really difficult and harrowing to read, but I think, wow, what a theme to explore. Um, and something I, I'm really pleased to see because I don't think I see enough. Um, and I'm just, yeah, pumped. And then we have The Wicked King by Holly Black. This is the sequel to The Cruel Prince, uh, which is a young adult fantasy series set in the fairy realm. We follow our protagonist, who's a human girl, whose sister is half fae, and her sister's father, who is fae, killed her human parents and took her and both her sisters to the fae world to be raised so she's grown up most of her life in the fae world and it's about her finding a place in a world where she's pretty much hated because the fae don't like humans um, and obviously she doesn't have the same powers as a human so she's sort of trying to um, navigate the political landscape of, of, this, of this place and it's quite dark and I love the world building in particular. I love like the um, interaction with sort of different fae folklore and um, I'm just really excited to see what happens next in the story. I've heard from some people this one's even better than the first one so that is excellent. I then have a book that I borrowed from my boyfriend and that is Paradise Rot, a novel by Jenny Hival. This one was originally written in Norwegian and is translated into English. And this one sounds like queer, surreal, magic realist fiction. It's about a woman that moves from Norway uh, to another country to go to university and uh, moves in uh, with a group of different people and it's written I believe in a really magic realist surrealist way so like strange things happen but it is equally an exploration of her finding herself and her sexuality um, as a queer woman so I'm, I'm like, pumped to read this. Last but not least is The Black God's Drums by P. Jelly Clark and this is a novella, it's one of Tor.com's uh, science fiction and fantasy novellas that they come out with and I have it on audiobook currently on the Scribd app and I'm really keen to read this one. This one is science fiction and it's set in an alternate New Orleans and we follow um, a young woman living in this New Orleans during the American Civil War uh, but she has this ability to communicate with the gods or has some sort of power that's been bestowed on her by the gods um, which means that she needs to keep that hidden but at the same time is going to play some sort of pivotal role I assume in the unfurling of the American Civil War and what's going on in New Orleans but I'm really excited to read that one. Those are all the books I plan on reading in February though. I might read less, I might read more, we will have to see, but I would love to hear from you if you have read or are planning on reading any of the books I've mentioned in the video. Let's chat, would love to hear from you, but until next time, happy reading and I'll see you all again soon. Bye guys!